Hello and welcome. We're glad you decided to join us today by downloading and listening to this week's featured message. We pray that you allow God to use this week's message to teach and inspire you while you listen. My sermon will be Your children are at their worst when they act most like you. Let us pray. Kind Father, lead us now into the study of your book. In Christ's name, amen. We welcome those who are joining us around the world <clears throat> and invite you to turn in your Bibles with us as we worship today. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, the second chapter, <coughs> verses 24. And 25. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his brother and shall cleave, father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be how many? And they were both naked, the man and his wife. And were not ashamed. I started last week's sermon with this sentence The choice we make for a person to date or court or be engaged to or marry is a direct reflection of our spiritual level at the time we make the choice. And it's been interesting, the calls I've gotten this week, people saying, Pastor, you're right. You are correct. I want to begin today's message with this sentence. Marriage is a spiritual relationship, not just a physical one. Therefore, Therefore, its challenges can be successfully met only by two genuinely spiritual people using genuinely spiritual principles. Now, thus far in this series of sermons on the Holy Ghost, we have learned... <coughs> The Holy Ghost is a gift planned, promised by Jesus to the church. Where the Holy Ghost is, there is action three. The Holy Ghost first contacts us in order to lead us to Christ as Savior for. The Holy Ghost's presence given us at the beginning of our Christian walk is not sufficient to see us to the end of that walk, five. The last days in filling of the Holy Spirit must first be preceded by cleansing out of your life. Six, the Holy Spirit empowers us to stand for truth. Seven, the Holy Spirit needs to be honored and thanked and recognized and included in every aspect of your life. What do you say, church? Eight, we learn that our temperament, Though a natural asset, be we melancholic, choleric, sanguine, or phlegmatic, though a natural asset, our temperament can be a detriment if not under the control of the Holy Spirit. Because as we study those temperaments, we found out they have both a positive and a negative, don't they? And the natural thing for a human being to do is to play to the negative side of who they are. But if they're in Christ, 
I'll say it again. If they're in Christ, something different can happen. We learn, number nine, that our natural God-given temperament has both good and bad. But by applying the fruit of the Spirit, thank you, Jesus, the Holy Ghost can overrule the bad and strengthen the good. And then number 10, we learned last week that the Holy Ghost must guide you in the successful choice of a mate. And the Holy Ghost's standards must be your standards. In short, most people marry for the wrong reasons. Spirituality is not on the list. Or they think of it later when they realize they got a mess on their hands. Now, the most irresponsible thing that a pastor can do or a presenter can do on the subject of marriage is, is act like that in one sermon he's going to cover the whole mess. I think I have in my files over 50 presentations, workshops on marriage have never covered the whole subject. And they're all kind of books. Some of you have them. Some folk are constantly reading books about marriage. They just need to get about being married. But they're constantly reading books about marriage. They want to be empowered. That's a big phrase now, you know, Carlson. Uh, empowerment. Empowerment comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> and the thing you've got to recognize, though a lot of the books are good, a lot of the books are good. A lot of the folk who wrote those books have bad marriages. So ultimately, it's not how much knowledge you have. It helps. It's what you're doing. I'll say amen for you. If you're having a hard time saying amen, I'll say amen for you. So I, I make no effort today to try to do what has not been done. This sermon doesn't cover the whole deal. In fact, I've narrowed this sermon to that statement. Marriage is a spiritual relationship, not a physical one. It's challenges, second statement, can only be successfully met by two genuinely spiritual people. And so, first of all in the sermon, we'll talk about the nature of marriage. And then we will talk about some of the non-negotiable. What word did I just say? Spiritual principles that must, uh, that must apply. You see, there, 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 there are some things, Tina... If you and Charles are going to work for the next 75, let's go for 75 <laughs> years, there's got to be some stuff, come on, y'all, that you must do. Can I get a witness? Some stuff can't be left out. We'll talk about some of those principles. Now, one of the reasons why I'm setting you up now for where I'm going <clears throat> one of the reasons why I think the subject of marriage is inexhaustible is because the relationship is by nature so godly. Uh, let me break that down. Building a marriage relationship over the years, and it takes years, years, y'all, so if you're just getting started, you got a few problems, you, you just, just hang on in there. You ain't seen nothing yet. See, first of all, before you can fix it, all the broken parts have to be on the table. And most of us come into marriage hiding broken parts. So it takes the pressure of marriage to get all the brokenness on the table, then you can get to fixing. It takes about seven to ten years to get all the stuff on the table. That's why when someone comes to me in seven, ten years, nobody wants to get a divorce. I say, for what? You, you, you don't know enough to get a, get a divorce. You don't know what you're divorcing. You don't know you. Now, if they're beating you up and you know knocking your head through the wall, that's another situation. But 
in most cases it takes a few years to just, you know, just, just find out what's going on because we kind of unfold slowly. Don't we unfold slowly? You know when you married you didn't tell everything. <laughs> Sit there looking at me. There's stuff you did not say. But marriage, marriage is a pressure cooker. Go on and say amen, married folk. And sooner or later it all rises to the top. Doesn't it? Then, then, should have prayed before, but then, you really learn how to pray. You show me folks who've been married for 30, 40 years, I'll show you some praying Negroes, some praying people. Praying. I mean, you've learned to agonize with God. All right, well, stay calm here. Stay calm. <coughs> it takes years. But I was making the point, why is the subject of marriage so inexhaustible? I was making that point. It is because, the, listen to the pastor, the marriage relationship parallels our relationship with Jesus Christ. Show me a person. Nice to meet you and your husband. Lovely folks. Show me a person. Show me a person. Listen to the pastor. Show me a person who is learning to be a Christian. And I'll show you a person who probably can make a good spouse. Because it takes some of the same stuff. <coughs> First of all, to be successful in a relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ, you must be submissive. And be willing to be changed. And you know if a marriage is going to work, you've got to be submissive. That wasn't loud enough. Amen. Amen. Two folks have to blend and that, <coughs> that takes giving up some stuff. And, 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 and the fact is, if you're going to stay married, you're going to give up way more than you had in mind when you said, I do. So there's parallels. Now, when the pastor says spiritual, what does he mean? Sp uh, in this sermon, the word spiritual is to be defined as something that is God-initiated and God-sustained. So I'm saying that, C.J., marriage must be God-initiated. So when you choose somebody to live with, you know, living with somebody, I'm a blessed man. I, I live with a sweet human being. You know, I feel sorry for these folks that got to come home with somebody who's got a bad mouth and attitude. I've never experienced that. Sister Wright is just pleasant. You know, that's a blessing. You know, let me just sit down here and just thank God. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. All the kind of stuff I got to deal with, and to come home to somebody who's mean, no, 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 sweet, sweet. Now, she, she, she can jack me up, but she's sweet. <laughs> Never raises her voice. Them green eyes turn purple. I know there's trouble in the house. <laughs> sweet. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, to live together a long time. You need to have God in that thing because, see, God knows what's coming down the line. And God knows what they didn't tell you when they married you. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. So what's the issue? Well, <coughs> let's get into it. Don't worry about the cough. I'm fine. I'm fine. Marriage is couched in spiritual terms in the Bible. Let's read some of them. <coughs> Genesis 1. I'm just establishing now in the Bible, Eric, that marriage is couched in spiritual terms in the Bible. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm dealing with, Cliff, right now. That's all I'm dealing with. Genesis, I'm going to move fast now. Move fast. Can't be here all day. Genesis 1, 27. So God, look, 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 look. So God did what? So see, the whole thing was started by God. So God created who? Man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. He took his hymnus, made it male and female, made it male and female. Ain't no in-between here. Yeah. 
and almost maybe just about male and female. He didn't divide himself into four parts. Ain't no trans nothing here. Male and female. I'm reading the Bible. God's Word. And then God, who did it? So notice in the two texts. Both texts start with God. So marriage, maleness and female, that, that, that's, that, that, that's God. So the whole, the, 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 the two sexes, God. Bringing them together, God. Look at Genesis 2.18. <coughs> see it? See it? Well, what are the first things you see in that text, 2.18? Who said it? And the Lord God said it's not good for man to be alone. So the whole marriage concept came out of the mind of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Only God could think of something called marriage. Two different folk, two different backgrounds, two different sexes, two different sets of DNA. Only God could think that would work. <coughs> Only God. So, see, and, 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 the, and, 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 and the foundation I'm laying, see, if you're going to go into marriage without God, it's his idea. How are you going to work it without God? It's like taking your Rolls Royce to be serviced at Sears and Roebuck. Sears. I'm old, so you should be a robot. <laughs> Got to take it to the Rolls Royce dealer. So marriage in the Bible is a God. Look, look, look at verse 21. Verse 21. And the, there it is again. What, what, what does verse 21 start with, y'all? And the Lord God caused <coughs> deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and took one of his ribs. Those of the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord, who, who made the rib? Had taken from man, made who? He, a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called. Yeah, he took a good look at Eve, he said, whoa, man. Some of y'all, yeah, 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 it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Downstairs, did y'all get it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But notice all these texts, the pastor is reading God, 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 God. So I don't apologize to you for saying that if you're going to have a successful marriage, God must be in it. It's his idea. <coughs> Look at Proverbs 18.22. So over there by Psalms. <laughs> Proverbs 18:22. Can't wait on you. Yeah, yeah. See, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor where of the Lord. See, it, notice it. Now notice this, Ken. I have not read one marriage text that does not have the Lord's name in it. So I'm trying to get something in your head, Vanessa. That this idea of people drifting into marriage without prayer, without God, it's Russian roulette. Even with God, there are going to be challenges. Can I get a witness in the house? Without Him, you don't have a prayer. Mark 10, 9. <coughs> Bible's consistent throughout its pages. Mark 10, verse 9. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we quote this in the in, in marriage ceremony, John. Look at this. What therefore God hath joined. Who joined it? God. Let no man put asunder. Now the question is, did God join it? But again, I have yet to find... And you see, so if you meet somebody in an ungodly place and you and the person carry on ungodly activity 
And you expect to have a successful marriage violating the principles of the God who made it? And so Mark says, what God hath joined together. So that raises the question. I'm going to let you answer it. Did God join you? Hmm. Ephesians. Ephesians tears you up. If you think marriage is not spiritual, read Ephesians 5. <coughs> no escape from this one. Ephesians 5. Now this is serious. This is serious. And, 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 and note the consistency. Note the consistency, John. Look, 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 look. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. See? You can't get into a marriage biblical statement without God. I want you to get that. So simple, but often missed. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the yeah, the Lord in there again. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is in there, is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Then husbands, love your wives, even as? Man, man, this is wonderful. Christ, Christ, Christ. Now I got news for you. Hope for you. We know, let's be honest, a lot of folk get involved without Christ. Going to get married without Christ. But if those two people let Christ come in he can take two people who probably never should have got married and work a miracle. Now don't gamble on that. The thing that is majestic about God, getting carried away now, I love him, his unusual, magnificent, immeasurable, constant, overflowing ability to take our junk and build a house. Because some of us didn't know the Lord when we got married. So don't be discouraged. Be a Christian. Now, but now you're saying, Pastor, what's the point? We already know that marriage is a spiritual relationship. I mean, why are you beating that horse to death? <coughs> well, because I know that far too many marriages are born in non-spiritual circumstances. And as we pointed out last week, far too many times our criteria, you see, folks, our criteria for choosing a mate so often omits or puts last the spiritual issues. See, the first question you ought to ask is, is this person one who will help me go to heaven? We tend to ask that question after we've fallen in love. After we're pregnant. After we've joined finances. After we've gotten hooked on how fine they are. After. And see, once you've gotten that far, then it's hard for you to hear the Holy Spirit. See, I can almost tell. You've been around as long as I have. Constant marriages. I can always tell when somebody comes to my, comes to my office, somebody will say they want, they, they want to know if they should get married. I can almost tell after five minutes whether they really come there to find out if they should get married. Or whether they came there to get married. Most people, once they make up their mind they're going to get married, 
freight train can't stop them. <laughs> now, folk, I've been there. I'm not just saying I've been there. And you can lay out all kind of stuff. But we love each other. Now, I really need to preach a whole separate sermon on the word love. The most misused word in the English language. We use it for everything, don't we? Love the car, love the house, love the movie, love fried chicken, love our wife. So we got the same emotions for a dead bird you got for your wife. So don't come to me with that love stuff. I done heard it. A two-year-old can use the word love. Don't mean squat. The Bible cries out in defiance, God is love. Therefore, true love is godly. So a lot of stuff being called love ain't never been and never will be. All that was free. Wasn't in my notes at all. Just stuck it in. <laughs> now, how does this spiritual thing work? Genesis 1.26. <coughs> and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness first thing you bring to a spiritual marriage is God's likeness what do you bring? God. yeah God's likeness God's likeness comes Damon as you seek the Lord in other words the, the person you get involved with you marry they must already know the Lord see don't when, when, when I hear somebody say that I'm, 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 winning, I'm, I'm winning them to Christ Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Only the Holy Spirit wins people. So if they've not already allowed Christ to do something in them, then you 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 lean over on one side. You're trying to carry them and you too. You can't do it. So both must bring God's image. What 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 must they bring? Then, 127, so God created man in his own image. Image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. The second they bring is, 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 is God's sexuality. God's sexuality. You know, God loves sex. Why are you afraid to say amen? It's his idea. You never thought of sex. God thought of sex. It's his idea. He loves it. In the proper context. What the devil does is try to distort your concept of sexuality before you marry so you come in with all kind of kinky stuff in your head. Oh, I'm sorry, visitors. I'm a very straight preacher. Very clear. Come in with all kind of, you know, hang-ups. And your partner ain't got them same hang-ups and you... So you, got, you, so you, you have to submit every part of yourself, your drives, to Jesus before you say, I do. Come on and say amen out there. And then, first you bring God's image, then God's sexuality, then uh, 2, 24 and 25, therefore shall a man leave his father. That's focus. You've got to bring focus. Married folks have to stay focused on their marriage. Not everybody else's marriage, their marriage. Your marriage. Not my marriage. Your marriage. Leave his father and mother. Leave the father and mother. Therefore shall the man and the woman leave the father and mother. Leave mama and daddy out of this thing. <laughs> cleave. Cleave. It, 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 it's from the Hebrew word for concrete. A mixture of sand. And cement and water. Sand, cement, and water. Now, I don't care whether she's the sand or you the sand, you the cement, she's the cement, you know, sand and water. And water is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Got to cleave one to another. And you know, uh, cement has to settle, doesn't it? Early on, you can step on it and leave marks. But as it hardens up, then it takes a sledgehammer to break them two folk up. Come on and say amen out there. 
Hallelujah, Jesus! And then it says they shall be one flesh. Didn't say unanimity, unity. No husband and wife are always going to agree. And I become highly suspicious. Remind them, we always get along. You're married to a corpse. <laughs> you can always get along with a corpse. No, 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 no. Follow the pastor now. Here's a sentence you don't want to mention. It is not important that husband and wife always agree, always agree. It is important that they always understand. That's unity. You want to be married to someone who's got their own mind. Come on, somebody. Their own thoughts. Their own opinions. To balance yours. Because most human beings are half crazy. So you need, you need, you need that, that same part of your spouse to match up with yours. Come on and say amen out there. We're twisted. You know we got kinks and hang-ups. Nobody's all together. There's no such thing as a sane human being. And you figured that out yet? Everybody's a little crazy. I've been done figured that thing out. I've been pastoring for 40 some years. I know that. <laughs> but, 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 when you come together to understand, so you just reach an understanding, and then and then you learn. You learn over the years. See some. See when, you, when some, some things. You know, don't, don't keep arguing about the same thing going over again. Particularly if it's not a salvation issue. We waste so much energy. If it's about salvation, hang in there. Stand firm. But it's about who's going to make up the bed. Leave that thing alone. Leave the bed unmade. You're going to get in it tonight anyhow. Don't leave the thing unmade. Break up a marriage over a bed. He won't make up the bed. So what? You won't get a new wig. You know, it's just... <clears throat> then verse 25 says, And they were both naked. They both what? They were both what? Talk to me. Naked. The word means vulnerable. It's not talking about clothes. It's talking about openness, honesty, vulnerability. You see, brothers and sisters... When you finally meet somebody, let me talk about this thing, Jesus. When you finally meet somebody, see, I'm talking about marriage as much like the relationship with Jesus Christ. When you finally, Jacob, meet somebody who can know the worst about you and know your weak points and not take advantage of you, glory! Hallelujah! Who loves you through your pain and loves you through your weakness and loves you through your downtime. Someone who says, they're naked, but I'm going to cover them with my love. Hallelujah! That's what Jesus does. That's how spiritual marriage works. And then you got to do something else. <coughs> Matthew, uh, Genesis 24, 1 through 4. Is this a good sermon? Yeah, I know it is. Genesis 24, 1 through 4. And Abraham, watch the pastor now. And Abraham was old. Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. Watch this text. Do not miss this text. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom <coughs> I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country, unto my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. The next thing you've got to do, after you practice those other spiritual principles, God's image, God's sexuality, focus, commitment, cleave, so forth, unity, not unanimity, uh, transparency, Abraham said, I want someone to marry my son who has a common spiritual dimension. 
See, Allison, that's why I keep coming back to this thing. We're trying to form successful unions with unbelievers. Now, I know y'all don't like to hear me talk about this. You get all nervous and upset and get stiff sitting in the pew. Well, just sit there stiff. Because I'm going to tell you now. It's a biblical principle. Don't get tied up with folks that don't have your same belief system. In fact, in Genesis 26, it says that, 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 <coughs> that Isaac and Rebekah were, were, were grieved when their son Esau married outside the church. Grieved. And then in Judges 3, we'll go there. This is powerful, Judges 3. Those of you who are turning me off right now, just, 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 just stay turned off. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back on you. Lord, help you. I pray for you. Genesis, uh, Judges, Judges 3. Did I say Judges? All right, Judges 3, verse 5. I can't wait on you. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites. Look at that. Dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, Jebusites. Watch the ites. Watch the ites. <laughs> Them ites will get you every time, brother. And they're all around you. They're in Alexandria and Upper Marlboro and D.C. And, and, and Columbia. Them ites are every... Watch them ites. <laughs> <coughs> Let me finish. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. Now look at verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The direct result of mixing belief systems in a marriage caused the believer to compromise. The non-believer did not compromise. And folks, I've seen, my wife and I have seen that thing in the church. Somebody comes, told my, well, you know, and, and all this thing. And then look up, you're the one compromising. They stand right where they are. They ain't moved an inch. A marriage is a spiritual relationship. And so the decisions must be made spiritually. <coughs> and so the Bible is replete with the sad stories of how a non-spiritual person tied up with a person who was not spiritual, uh, where a, a, a spiritual person tied up with a person who was not spiritual or of another belief system. I mean, look at Ahab and Jezebel. Solomon and his many wives. Some wives just took him out. Of course, a brother with that many wives. There's another sermon, so I ain't going there. <laughs> I made this point earlier in the sermon, shifting now. Building a marriage relationship over the years, and it does take years, incorporates some of the same principles that are required to be in relationship with the Almighty God. The main set of principles that Jesus gave us to guide our life are the Ten Commandments. What did I say? <coughs> Jesus in John 14, 15 said, If you love me, do what? You ever thought about the commandments and marriage? Let's go, let's go team up there. Commandments in marriage. First commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first law of marriage is, put God first. Do what? Put God first. Let me say it again. If they don't bring God with them into the relationship, you're in trouble. They got to bring their part of God. You got to bring your part of God. And you can't carry their part of God for them. Second commandment says, don't make any graven images. Some of the graven images, Larry Maribel, of marriage are nice home, nice cars. Come on, y'all. Both have good jobs. Are you with me? 
education, and you begin, you begin to measure the success of your marriage by these idols. A successful marriage is not measured by how much stuff you've accumulated, but how close are both of you to Jesus Christ. And, and, how close are you now in compared to how close you were when you started. <coughs> so the second commandment is the marriage commandment, third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Folk, if you're going to call yourself a Christian marriage, then it's got to have two Christian people. To stand before a Christian pastor now pronounce you husband and wife by the power and authority invested in me. But God hath joined us together. Let no man put asunder. Those words are meaningless if the two people the pastor is saying it to are not really Christian. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain when it comes to your marriage. Are you listening to me? Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, a marriage without worship. Come on, y'all. Uh, uh, the Sabbath allows a family, that's why we're here today, to come aside and remember the Lord who created the marriage. There are two abiding institutions that come down from Eden, the Sabbath and marriage. And on the seventh day they should come together, husbands and wives, with their children, walking in the church on God's holy day. Come on and say amen out there. <laughs> Marriage is bound together. <clears throat> bound together by worship, by extolling God. Fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Two ways this commandment applies to marriage. Number one, many husbands and wives become mothers and fathers. And you ought to respect one another as such. The father of a woman's children ought to be treated as that. The mother of a man's children ought to be treated as that. Never contribute to the disrespect of your spouse in terms of the children. God have mercy upon you. Some of our mouths need to be sealed shut until Jesus comes. We say stuff in front of the children to demean our spouses. Take your argument to the bedroom, outside. Arguing and fussing in the car and the kids sitting in the back seat wondering what in the world is going on. Throwing things at one another in the house. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Because then those children will grow up either disrespecting what it means to be a father or disrespecting what it means to be a mother based on what they saw us say and do. There's a second way that commandment applies to the marriage. All of us come from mothers and fathers. Now I know that in a marriage... Many times we bring the pain of not having been well-fathered or well-mothered. But you know, that commandment is a strong one, Keith. Didn't say honor your father and your mother because they were good. It says honor your father and your mother. See, God puts something special on that position. So if you've got to hang out with your parents and so forth and so on, you need to settle that. Don't bring that into the marriage. You marry someone who's going to hang out with their parents. They, 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 they bring those hang-ups into the relationship. So the fifth commandment is key to a successful marriage, a spiritual relationship. Thou shalt not kill. Now, we know that sometimes this emotion comes upon you in a marriage. <laughs> I mean... Got to sit down on this one, Keith. <laughs> the commandment can be taken literally. Thou shalt not take out your spouse. <laughs> but, but the commandment also is talking about, you remember Jesus applied it to the mouth. To the mouth. You can kill one another. You know, see, Sister Wright knows me better than anybody. She really does. And so she can say things that would just push me to pieces. 
And, and, and even if you said it and you were right, I'd ignore you. I know you. I don't have to live with you. I don't know. But Sister Wright says it. See what I'm saying? Some of us have said things to our spouses. God help us. They've never gotten over. There is power in being a spouse, and some of us misuse our power. We know we can bring them down. We know we can tear them up. We know we can demean them. And then we do it in front of people. And the God who knows every dirty thing you've done does not expose you in front of folk. How dare you expose your spouse in front of folk? If they're dumb and stupid and ain't worth a dime, then some dumb, stupid, not worth a dime person chose them. Thou shalt not kill. Words that lift a person. Or if they're wrong, tell them. But don't, don't strip a person down. And when you have such inner insecurity that you've got to pull your spouse down to nothing to feel good about yourself, something wrong with you. You need help. Move in with the psychologist and stay there till you're well. We have no right to take our spouse and reduce them verbally. Thou shalt not kill. Next commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Next commandment. The seventh needs no exposition. Eighth commandment. Thou shalt not steal. <coughs> thievery in a marriage is terrible. No, I ain't talking about stealing money out of your wife's purse. <laughs> that too. <laughs> or you're stealing money out of his purse. Watch the pastor stealing time, stealing love, stealing priority. Stealing from them their dignity and self-respect. It ties right in with thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. See, one of the most important things that goes on in marriage is time together. It's precious, isn't it? The time you spend together. And, and, and folk, don't take that for granted. One of the big dangers about being married is being married. And you get tied up. Listen to the pastor. You know I love every last one of you. I love, I love every last one of you. You get tied up in the things and the stuff. And you start stealing from one another love and affection and patience. And words of affirmation and encouragement. Encourage your spouse. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Commandment number nine. Don't lie. Don't lie. See, let me tell you. Keep that commandment up there. Let me tell you. Listen to the pastor. The most important thing in a marriage, aside from love, is trust. Whoo! And many times, Mama Lee, when couples come in before me and they're going at one another, I listen, I listen, I listen. Doesn't take me long to figure out that the real problem is trust. Somebody hurt somebody down the line and they got defensive. And you see, here's the thing about it, folks. It is hard to love somebody with your arm up. If you're trying to be in love and be loved and protect yourself at the same time, you're in the wrong business. Marriage is the ultimate vulnerability. Got to drop your guard. Try it again. They may have done so and so and so. You may have caught them. So what? If you stayed with them. And you're going to spend the next 15 years keep bringing that stuff up. Then go on and be a man or woman. Go and get a divorce and live by yourself. 
If you're going to stay with them, you got to lay that thing down. Come on, somebody! Commandment 10, thou shalt not covet. That is, be satisfied with what you got. Don't come to CPC looking around. And so the Lord gives us, let's put our last slide up there, the fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Love to deal with your hate. Joy to deal with your sadness and complaining and depression. Peace to deal with your worry and inner turmoil that so many of us bring into marriage. Long-suffering to deal with your impatience and intolerance. Gentleness, to deal with your harshness and indifference and, and, and revengeful spirit. Goodness, uh, to deal with your selfishness and self-centeredness. Faith, to deal with your doubt and your fear and anxiety and insecurity. Meekness, to deal with your pridefulness and self-seeking and lack of forgiveness and lack of forgiveness and lack of forgiveness and lack of forgiveness. I'll give you this fruit. And you see, let me tell you again, the fruit can overrule. The problem is we wait too late to let the fruit come in and take over. Most marriages in trouble can be fixed. Let me say that to the world, those listening, those here. Most marriages can be fixed, but it takes something you're not ready to give. That's yourself, your pride, your opinion, your desire to be right, your desire to win. It don't mean squat. You want to save your marriage? You've got to be like Christ. Open not his mouth. Mistreated but not mistreated in return. Spent all night in prayer. See, the real question becomes, are you willing to pay the price? Do not, do not take God cheaply. I've seen God take some marriages that people thought, and, and those folks, not only are they together, they're better, they're happier. But they both had to sell completely over to Jesus Christ the righteous. He will milk you and bleed you of yourself. But our problem is we have an agenda we don't want to let go. We go into marriage with what we want, seeking what we desire. We go into marriage to receive, not to give. And we got all these pictures about how it's going to be for me. And many of those pictures we never discussed with the person we were marrying. We just expected them to step up and fulfill our dreams. But the fruit of the Spirit, self control, to take care of our rage. Anger, jealousy, and that most dangerous word of all in marriage, blame. 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 I can tell you this. After 40-some years, it can get better. And you see, <coughs> it really doesn't, it, it, it doesn't get, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't get better because you stop having arguments and misunderstandings. Now, we have gotten by the argument stage. Sister Wright and I figured out about 10 years ago, 15, argument is just a big waste of time. You get done, you're tired. <laughs> tired. I don't feel good. Come on, y'all, you don't feel good. You know, and walk around in their, their, their corner, their corner. You know, two grown people, two grown people in their corner, their corner. Walk past each other, don't speak. Oh, that's just dumb. That's just dumb. Don't speak. Don't speak. And you walk, walk by them so they can see that you're not going to speak. Yet. <laughs> that's stupid. That's stupid grown people with jaw. 
jobs. <laughs> running other people. No, 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 no. It's a waste of time. Waste of time. Just, 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 just leave it alone. You know, leave it alone. You know, and, and you learn, you learn. You know, something just ain't worth it. Just ain't worth it. Just, you know, let it go by. That's why the room has, you know, five, six, seven, uh, you know, rooms in it. You know, find a room. They got their room over there. Work it out with Jesus. Come on back. You know, hug each other. You know, do something nice. But don't dwell on that thing. See, it just drains you. Drains you. When you come to church, your face is all sorry. I can tell when you get out the car. You know, bam! <laughs> Oh, me. Here they are. They, they argue. You know, don't even look back. Don't even look back. Get out the car. Swishing, you know. Don't look back, you know. And last Sabbath, he rushed around, opened the door. You know, he drives off before you can get out the car. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute waste of time and human energy. How many of y'all know I'm telling the truth? I want to say one more thing to you, then I need my song. I need my song. Listen to the pastor. Great marriages make great churches. That's why no matter what you bring to me, pastor prays for you, agonize for you, my heart gets filled with tears. My eyes gets wet. My face gets wet with tears because I love you. And I've seen, seen what God can do. Amen. Come on, y'all. I told you, I told you, the marriage is like the relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's going to be people in heaven that nobody thought would be there. You ought to praise God for yourself. Come on now. Come on now. Going to be folks who nobody thought would make it in. They're going through the gate. Why? Because they gave themselves to Jesus Christ. Take yourself to Jesus. I said take yourself to Jesus. Keep most of your married problems between you and Jesus. Holy Spirit can take your marriage feeble though it may be make it a trophy to the grace of God the love of God can do that what do you say God bless you who are watching me in other settings maybe husband and wife together just grab each other's hand right now and squeeze that hand and ask the Lord to help you maybe it's not going good for you but you can pray 
and you can try harder by God's grace. Don't give up. Don't give up. Make your home, your marriage, a victory to Jesus Christ. For those of you here, I offer the same. I'm not going to do anything dramatic like having all the husbands and wives stand up and all that kind of thing. You can settle this right there in your pew. Any of us who are married know that it takes some work. But remember, it's a spiritual relationship. It'll be settled by spiritual principles. I've just shared a few. Not by winning arguments. Not by one-upsmanship. Not by demeaning the other person. Christian principles. Bow your heads. Let me pray for the marriages now. Father in heaven, we're seeking the Holy Spirit in all that we do. And so as my dear sister now sings this second verse, I dedicate this verse <laughs> to the marriages. Please, sister, sing. We're all praying. When holy time shall pass away yes, Jesus. and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, <laughs> when men who hear refuse to pray. I said that the relationship with a husband and wife of a husband and wife parallels that of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody today has been in a divorce relationship with Jesus. Or you've never said yes to his appeal to be the love of your life. You've been thinking about becoming a part of this church. You've been thinking about taking Bible studies. Maybe transferring your membership. God's love reaches out to you today and you'd like to come forward. You'd like to come forward. The Holy Spirit is saying, come and give yourself to Jesus Christ. And you want to do that right now, please. As she sings this next verse, just rise and come wherever you are. Church is praying for you. Just get up and come. Who will do it? Could we with ink the ocean feel And were the skies of parchment made Were every soul can come. the wheel Upstairs can come every man a scribe Balcony's by not trade. too far Jesus gives in and comes on. 
Jesus. Please. Please. finish my prayer now. Father, thank you so much for speaking to our hearts today. Be thou kind to that soul with whom you now wrestle and yet holds out. Maybe even at the door, as happens so many Sabbaths, they'll come and say, I should have come, present themselves to you. But thank you for speaking to us today. We have much to think about. In Jesus' name, and the people said, Amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Now, whenever I preach a sermon like this, I always like to just say, if I said anything that offended anyone, it was not intentional, but most things I said today, you know me, I meant it. I meant it. I meant it. God help us. God bless us. If you have any questions about the message, or would like to contact us with any prayer request, please use the prayer request tool at the top of the page. We invite you to share this message with someone else and check back next week for another message. Thank you for visiting with us at www.cpcsda.org. We pray that you experience the presence of God always with you.